Here we go. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. The time is now 1.07 p.m. and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education regular meeting of August 11, 2020 is called to order. Marilyn, are there individuals who wish to address the board during today's meeting? There are. Um, there are three individuals that have indicated um, that they want to address the board and we see them in the um, waiting in the lobby. So Mike Flaminio will admit them. Um, I will read the rules for public comment. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes to address the board and I will keep track of the time. We'll be strictly following the time limits so that everyone has an opportunity to speak. It's the practice of the board not to respond to comments during the public participation portion of the meeting. We will maintain an atmosphere of respect for all people and disrespecting anyone by name or otherwise will be asked to cease. Uh, welcome caller, please state your name and city before you provide your comments and then also if you're representing a group. And I will let you know when you have um, used up your three minutes. Mike, can you let the first caller in please? What's your sign? On the way, it says admitting, one second. Hello caller, are you on the line? Yes. If you can please state your name, where you're from, and if you're representing a group and then begin providing your comments, I'll time let you know when your three minutes are up. Thanks for calling in. Okay, are you ready for me to start? I am. Okay, hi, I'm Kathy Luster, a library media specialist at East Middle School in Plymouth Canton Schools and a board member, past president of the Michigan Association for Media and Education. Um, MAME wants to thank the Michigan Department of Education for including us on the teams that developed the Learning at a Distance Guidance Document and the Summer Learning Guidance Document. Um, school library media specialists were very busy during this past Learning at a Distance. A main survey of its members found school librarians were delivering instruction, including digital citizenship lessons, promoting reading, engaging learners in literacy development, providing learning resources and innovative technology support to students, family, educators, and administrators, providing professional development to educators on distance learning tools, supporting equity of access to our students, providing copyright guidance, and more. Thank you to the board for the thought and work that went into the updated top 10 strategic plan. I believe school library media specialists can support the vision, mission, and guiding principles of the MDA strategic plan, and MAME looks forward to working with MDE towards the outline goals. In particular, school library media specialists empower all members of the learning community to become critical thinkers, enthusiastic readers, skillful researchers, innovative creators, empathetic global citizens, and ethical users of information. The school library is a welcoming place where all learners are valued and find support and resources for both academic and personal growth. Studies and data show that when a certified library media specialist teaches and collaborates within their school community, students have higher reading and writing achievement, higher ACT scores, higher graduation rates, better information literacy skills, and higher rates of success in college. Studies also show that students who are economically disadvantaged, black, Hispanic, or have disabilities benefit proportionally more than general students from the presence of a full-time certified library media specialist. I would like to highlight that school libraries have been leaders in the maker movement, which gives students the opportunity to be creative, to learn design thinking and to practice problem solving skills. Since the 2014 State Board of Education statement supporting access for all students in Michigan to properly staffed school libraries and the inclusion of the appropriately staffed school librarians 
in the original top 10 and 10 goals and strategies, there has been very slow but steady increases in the staffing of school libraries in our state. Access to certified school librarians is called for in the school-wide essential literacy practices and the School Finance Research Collaborative Report. In addition, equity of the access to certified is supported by a number of associations in our state. I believe to maintain the positive momentum, we need to keep um, media specialists in some way in the new strategic plan. Thank you very much for your cooperation and supporting education for all students in Michigan. Thank you. And do we have the next caller, Mike? Hello, do we have a caller on the line? Yeah, so can you hear me? I can hear you fine. If you can state your name and where you're from, and if you're representing a group, I will start the timer uh, and you can offer your comments. So thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Mayer. That's spelled M-A-I-R. I'm calling from Traverse City. And uh, I've been watching your, uh, your meetings. Uh, and uh, the reason I'm calling is because of the, uh, the great interest in uh, back to school or back to schooling of some kind. And uh, I'm on the ballot in the November election. I'm running for the Board of Education. So I'm hoping to join your group. So I don't represent any other groups. And uh, I have been elected. I was elected as a county commissioner in 16 and I served in 17 and 18 here in Grand Traverse County, representing uh, most of Traverse City, including the, the entire downtown area. So, and I had worked for the federal government. Uh, I worked for the uh, U.S. Department of Transportation in a special group, uh, which was a post 9-11 uh, counterterrorism group, actually. So that was pretty fascinating. Reminds me of today, uh, you know, that we had to, uh, to come up with many new methods uh, quickly to try to get back to some kind of normalcy, as they say. But I should tell you that uh, today, the Intermediate School District here, the Traverse Bay Intermediate School District had their board meeting, and I made a similar call to, uh, to announce that I'm running. And last night was the uh, TCAPS, or the Traverse City Area Public Schools. And I've been attending their meetings, and I know some of their board members, and um, I'm quite familiar with everything that's going on. Uh, I'm originally from, uh, uh, the Southfield Public Schools. I went K through 12 in Southfield. So I'm a product of the public schools and I support them. I support public schools over private schools actually. Um, so whether it's the intermediate school districts or the, uh, the other public school districts, I am really interested and I really want uh, everybody to have a great education. I, I had taken polls uh, several years on uh, the day, April 15th, the people pay their taxes and they used to do that by mail more than they do now. But uh, I would hold this thing called a penny poll in front of the post office. People would be able to put 10 pennies in a jar and they were all labeled for different parts of the federal budget. And this was a pretty good cross section, not scientific, but a good cross section. And the two things that always came up first are just as important today as they were then and that's health and education. So that's my position. Uh, I think much, many, many more federal dollars should be going to, uh, to education today and also to health. And you know, our health and education systems need more funding. When the government uh, has a stimulus bill, a very large portion of it should for be for just those things and not so much corporate aid. So I'm more on the side of the people than the corporation. And I'm definitely on the side of public education. So, thank you very much. Thank you. I hear the little bell. That's a nice bell. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for calling in. Okay, and thank you very much. And I'll be uh, following up by uh, listening to your recorded meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Hello? Mike, I believe we have one more caller. Caller, I'm getting some feedback. If, if there's something on in the background, if you could turn that off. Yeah, I will. As soon as I'm joined, I'm listening to the speaker before me. I'm listening to the meeting. 
It's, Great. it's off now. So, Are you fine now? We, the sound is just great now. So if you could please state your name, where you're from, and if you're representing a group, and then I will let you know when your three minutes are up. Thanks for calling in. Thanks so very much. I apologize. I, I, there must be a delay in what I'm seeing on my computer versus what I'm uh, what is actually happening live. I'm still hearing you talk to the <laughs> to Mr. Mayor. My name is Sonia Ponce. I uh, am from the city of Detroit. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Superintendent Rice and uh, other members of the board. Uh, uh, congratulations to Teacher of the Year, Dono, and uh, special thanks to Vice President Hugh for inviting me to address you today. Now, my name is again Sonia Ponte. I'm a degree mechanical engineer with Building Vitals, a local uh, building health consulting firm, and uh, I'm also a member of ASHRAE, the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning. I serve as the chair of the Government Affairs Committee for ASHRAE and Freight Draft Chapter. Uh, ASHRAE is a global professional society. We've got 190 chapters, 130 countries, committed to serving humanity by advancing the arts and sciences of heating, ventilating, air conditioning, refrigeration, and their allies. Some of the work that we do includes writing standards of care for the design, construction, operation, and maintenance of commercial buildings, including schools. Several of the standards we write are adopted in whole or incorporated in part into many federal and state building codes, including Michigan's current energy, building, and mechanical codes. In short, we are the subject matter experts on building HVAC systems. All right, now, uh, the $64,000 question and everybody's mind is, what about COVID? How do I reopen my building? How do I protect my occupants as I resume um, in-person teaching? Uh, numerous research studies have shown over the years that building HVAC systems, the indoor environments they help to create, have a profound impact on the performance and productivity of building occupants, students, teachers, and administrators. Whether we're in a pandemic or not, Properly operating and maintaining HVAC equipment and systems is essential to our ability to provide a high quality environment for our students to learn in. But under current pandemic conditions, certain changes to the way we operate building HVAC systems can help reduce the airborne dissemination of infectious pathogens. In particular, enhanced ventilation and filtration provided by HVAC systems can help reduce the risk of transmission by reducing concentrations of pathogens, including the pathogen that causes COVID-19. Changes to system operation are not as simple as pushing a button or swapping out a filter. HVAC equipment part of an integrated system of various and varied pieces that have been selected or specially designed to work with cohesive units. When changes are made to one part of the system, and mm. I just want to finish a little bit. Impacts are uh, experienced by other parts of the system. If you want additional information, I, I want to make you aware that there are a thousand members of ASHRAE in the state of Michigan, and we are here and available to assist you in um, providing guidance for reopening your facilities. If you have questions, please feel free to email us at um, COVID19 at ASHRAE.org, or you can visit the Detroit chapter of ASHRAE, right? Just ASHRAE. Or, or you can contact me, Sonia, S O N Y A dot Pons, O U N C Y at gmail.com. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for providing comment. Dr. Rice, that concludes public comment. I have no more public participants. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, and thank you to our uh, public speakers this afternoon for providing public comment. Our next topic is Michigan's federal special education determination and our progress on the path forward. This presentation will be led by Dr. Scott Kennigschnecht, um, Deputy Superintendent of P20 System and Student Transitions, and Ms. Terry Rink, Director of Special Education. This is an informational presentation. No board action is required. Gentle people, good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Rice, and thank you for the opportunity to share some good news with the board this afternoon regarding our most recent determination. 
Um, a quick note, Terry is not uh, joining me this afternoon. Her and her team are finalizing some much needed guidance that will be going to the field shortly. So I will be uh, be doing the presentation uh, by myself this afternoon. So let me pull this up and confirm that everybody can see the main slide. Everybody good with the main slide? Yes. OK, <clears throat> so again, the idea for the presentation this afternoon is to give you an update on uh, what we call the path forward, which is a strategic action plan um, around special education system delivery in the state of Michigan. And I presented um, a number of times to the board on this particular issue, um, but wanted to give you an update um, based upon our, our most recent determination. So what you have in front of you on the screen um, is a historical look um, of the past three years regarding our determination from the federal government. If you recall uh, in 2018, the summer of 2018, we received a, de a determination from the federal government uh, that said our system delivery for special education was in need of intervention. Um, and again, I presented the information to you, explained um, how th they look at um, 50% of compliance indicators, 50% of results indicators. The numbers are before you, um, and we scored a 59.17. And that was really a, a, a alarming. Uh, more importantly, it was a call to action. Again, I presented multiple times. You know that we've pulled a, a large group together, a steering committee. We also then had those steering committee members nominate um, uh, work group members, and we began um, a, a tremendous amount of work around this issue in, in order to improve those systems. Fast forward to last summer uh, and we saw some growth. Um, we scored a 65.48. Um, we increased our compliance um, uh, slightly uh, and then increased our results slightly as well. Uh, that put us back into what, again, the federal government determines uh, is the needs assistance category. Uh, and we continued to work. And you fast forward to this past uh, late June, uh, early July, we received our determination score um, and are pleased to um, to share that that is once again increased um, to 72.5%. Uh, on the compliance side, we are nearly 100% compliance. Uh, and on the result side, we continue to make progress, though there's still uh, a, a lot of work yet to do. Uh, in terms of the scores themselves, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Again, you've seen this both in a presentation and you also have it in writing, but there is a rubric associated. Yep, Dr. Kennedy Schnecht, we we are seeing simply the uh, the title slide. We are not seeing the individual slides rolling forward. Ooh, let me go back and reload. My apologies. Uh, let me try something different and see if. Uh, are you now seeing the rubric slide? Yes. All right, so I'm going to go one up and just recap quickly. Here are the three scores that I just recapped. Everybody seeing that? Yes? Yes. OK, so again, uh, I won't go over what I just shared, but you can see the growth from 2018 to 2020. You can see the growth on the compliance side and on the results side. So now back to rubric. So this is the rubric that accompanied the 1819 uh, results indicators and what the scores had to be in order to um, earn the points. I'm not going to go back and forth, but I did want to include it in, in case after the presentation you wanted to see uh, what it took to score a one and what it took to score a two. Um, this is the rubric for 2020. The rubric changed uh, for 2020. So I wanted to share that as well, um, that the 1819 rubrics uh, are, were different or are different than 2020. All of the information is there. Uh, again, I'm not going to spend time toggling back and forth, but I wanted to include it in case you had an interest when we were finished. I do want to spend a little bit of time taking a look um, at the indicators themselves on the results side and then the scores uh, by year. So if you remember, um, the federal government looks at reading, which is on this slide, uh, in math, which will be on the following slide. And these are the indicators that they look at uh, when they uh, are measuring uh, progress. Uh, so percentage of fourth grade students with disabilities participating in regular statewide assessments. This isn't about any score on the assessment, just how many are participating in the fourth grade, how many are participating in the eighth grade. And what you can see in 2018 uh, are the percentages. You can see the scores in 2019, percentages and scores, 2020, percentages and scores. And so you can see that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each one of these 
these slots, um, but want to uh, to highlight some. Uh, you can see growth in the areas. Uh, another indicator they look at is percentage of fourth grade students with disabilities scoring at basic or above on the NAEP. So this is performance. Um, and you will see um, some growth between 2019 um, and 2020 uh, regarding reading at the fourth grade level for students with disabilities. This is percentage of students participating in the NAEP. Again, you can see growth. Uh, this is percentage of students uh, with, uh, in eighth grade with disabilities scoring basic or above, uh, and then percentage of eighth grade students actually participating. So this is a longitudinal look at not only the percentages, um, but the points that were earned. This next slide is second verse, same as the first, except math. So I will not go through all of them. They're the very same indicators, but it's regarding math. Uh, and it's the same concept. Here's your percentage, there's your score, uh, and you can simply follow along um, from uh, from left to right to uh, to see the, the growth both in performance and in score. The final results indicators that they look at are graduation and dropout rate. Uh, we have a great amount of work to do in this area. Um, the good thing is we're heading in the right direction. You can see that the graduation rate for students with disabilities is increasing. Uh, and the dropout rate is decreasing. So though we weren't able to score points based upon the federal uh, government's formula, um, the, we are moving the needle in the right direction around both of those issues as well. So that's a look at all three of the past years um, and where we've been and where we are. Um, a little bit about the initiative itself. I'm not gonna talk a lot about this because you've heard about it a number of times again over the past couple of years, but we, we have a vision um, regarding the path forward for our students with disabilities. Um, and we also believe we have a responsibility to put this vision um, into action, and that's what we've been doing. Um, if you can recall, the process uh, really involved a, a steering committee beginning with the end in mind. Uh, if we were to create um, an effective special education delivery system in the state of Michigan, what would that look like? Uh, and these indicators rose to the top in terms of what that would look like, these 10 indicators. Um, and based upon that, um, uh, we said we've got to act on them and bring these indicators uh, in what we call into actuality, and which is what we have been doing. The indicators then were lumped into eight groups. Again, this should look familiar to you. I presented on this before, but we are uh, committed to improving instruction and inclusive learning environments, uh, to developing multiple pathways to graduation, to um, uh, really enhancing the personal curriculum um, and bringing a greater awareness around that. I believe we are moving the needle on that. I'm uh, taking a look at how we certify our educators. Um, again, I believe we're we're looking at that as well. Um, what type of professional learning supports are we providing to our paraprofessionals, our teachers, um, our bus drivers, um, our, our principals when we're working with our students with disabilities? Um, how we look at and utilize data uh, around our students. Uh, what we do around MSTEP and NAEP communication. Uh, and the final piece uh, in the uh, the eight domains was funding. And again, those should sound familiar to you. How do we know if we're going to be successful? It's basically a measurable increase uh, or a measurable decrease in the key indicators, and we are seeing these. Uh, we are seeing a measurable increase in MSTEP uh, participation. We are seeing a measurable increase in NAEP performance and participation. We are seeing an increase in graduation rates, and we're seeing a decrease in dropout rates. And this was uh, uh, how the work was phased out, how it was chunked out um, in phase one, phase two, and phase three. Um, obviously, COVID has provided some very unique challenges to um, to making some of these initiatives happen. Fortunately, we were able to uh, have a lot of momentum going into uh, COVID in March around these particular issues. Um, we have an all ed network uh, partnership with uh, with MAISA and with MACE. Um, we are taking a look at alternative diplomas. Uh, we had done a lot of work at the department, cross department work around the personal curriculum. Um, in sharing uh, information with local school districts. Uh, and just prior to COVID, I was able to convene many of the major state associations, MEA, AFT, uh, the principals, the superintendents, the ISDs, um, and many others to really start to plan around how can we provide coordinated and aligned professional development around these particular issues. And that meeting took place in late February and we know what happened in mid-March. So we were able to start the conversation um, but obviously, uh, given COVID, uh, this has slowed a bit, but we're still committed to the work. Um, we're seeing progress. We're pleased with the progress. We know we have a lot of work yet to do, but wanted to uh, to share that information with the board and certainly answer any questions that you may have.
questions of Dr. Kenichnecht or comments associated uh, with his presentation. Dr. Albridge. Thank you. So it's great to see the numbers moving in the right direction and congratulations on all the hard work that you guys have done to get to this point. Um, I just had one quick question on the slide that talks about education versus dropout. Um, I know that sometimes the word dropout doesn't really mean what we what it sounds like it means. So can you define um, in this context what dropping out means? That's a complicated question, <laughs> one that we, we really grappled with as we were doing the work. Um, it's very complicated. It's not what you would consider a traditional dropout um, or may consider a traditional dropout. Um, it is um, what we found is that when a student drops out of school in Michigan, um, in MSDS, which is the reporting uh, mechanism that's, that districts use to report, there are, I believe, six or seven different opportunities for a district to, sit, to report why the student dropped out. Um, and what we found is uh, in that year, there was about 6,000 students who had dropped out. Half of them were coded as unknown. And you may remember this conversation, which was troublesome to us, because what does unknown mean? You know, the students don't um, vaporize. They have to go somewhere. Um, and maybe they maybe they dropped out um, for a month and then re-enrolled at another school district. Um, you know, maybe they dropped out and in, 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 uh, moved to another state um, and that record review didn't catch up yet. So that's one of the pieces that we really want to, if you, if you remember on that professional development slide, that we want to work with the pupil accounting folks to really try to provide them some training and information to try to better define what that dropout means. So um, that, that's what we found through the process. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Albert, to follow up? So just to be clear, um, you know, in some cases we, if a student doesn't, doesn't graduate within a certain time period, we call them a dropout, even though technically they've never dropped out of anything. Is that the case here or is this just, um, they, they have, we've, we've, they've stopped attending a school and we're not quite sure where they went from there. Yeah, that's not the, the case here. There are there are some questions that we do have around our 22 to 26 year old population. Um, but in terms of the dropout uh, being calculated as a dropout, it is what you had said. It's a it's a student that leaves a school district. Our question is, did they go somewhere else? What type of record keeping um, is associated with that? Um, other states, you know, we looked at Minnesota and they have 12 uh, reportable indicators for districts to submit to the department in terms of why the student dropped out. Now that may not prohibit the student from dropping out, but what it really provides is some qualitative data for us uh, as to the why. So then what can we do as a state department or what can local districts do to provide more and better supports for our kids so they don't drop out? Um, but yeah, that's what it is. Now the 22 to 26 question, that was interesting for us. Um, um, because we have completers um, and, uh, and so we are working with uh, the federal government right now. We're the only state that does 22 to 26. And so um, how that factors into our graduation rate, we're still in conversations with them um, regarding that. We're the only state that does 22 to 26? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, President Albridge. Uh, Dr. Pugh. I just didn't want to miss this opportunity to, you know, acknowledge this, that we are heading in the right direction. I know that uh, we have more work to go, but but I uh, definitely hear the commitment of the team to, to get us there. So I just wanted to uh, give kudos to, to you and, and the team, as well as the department, uh, Dr. Rice. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is Michelle. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. OK, I I couldn't see this. I'm having trouble with my teams and I couldn't see the um, display that you you did, Scott, so I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to um, I know there was a tremendous amount of work that you did to um, and and others, many others, Terry um, Chapman for one, but all, all the whole department and the special ed area and many stakeholders. So I, I want to just um, commend you for your work on this and, and improving this. I also just wanted to say um, as a mother who had a child go through the 18 through 26 year old program, how um, 
really important that is to families in our state that we have that support. Um, you know, so, it, and I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful that the our state offers it and, and to so many families um, that, that really need it. So, um, uh, I also, you know, in the, in the past, I, I, my hope is that um, even, you know, we're looking at the compliance standard that are set to us by the federal government, but I would also, and I know you feel this way, um, want to expand um, and improve uh, outcomes for kids with special, you know, uh, special needs or special ed students, because we know they're, um, for many categories of students, their unemployment rates are, are astronomical, their op opportunities to participate in the community um, are, are limited. Um, especially in Metro Detroit with our terrible mass transportation system. <laughs> but um, so anyway, I just I wanted to thank you um, for all that work. I was glad I could be a part of it. And um, and uh, and I just hope I'm hoping in the future um, there can be even more advancement on the metrics that we think are important. Thanks. Well, thank, thank you, you Ms. Vecto. Dr. Pritchett. Thank you. Um, I'd like to first commend um, you and the staff and all of the individuals in the state who are uh, taking this um, report seriously and clearly we're moving in the right direction. Just a point of clarification, and I know we understand that, but in case the public is misunderstanding that, uh, on a couple of your charts you had test results and test participation from 2020, which is not those tests were not taken in 2020. I just wanted that kind of clarified in public that those would have been uh, delayed results, um, which would have been the case anyways. But I just didn't want anyone confused on the fact that, you know, wait a minute, I thought we didn't take standardized assessments this spring, which we didn't. So, yes, thank you, Judy. And that's, um, I was going to to uh, conclude with that. Um, to Judy's point, when we look at MSTEP participation in the 2020 determination, that's really the 2019 school year MSTEP participation. So I have an email into um, the, the Office Director of Special Ed at the federal government, uh, to your point, inquiring about next year's determinations. What is that going to look like? Um, because obviously we did not administer a state assessment. Many other states didn't either. Um, and so what is that going to do to the federal determination process? Um, I'm waiting to hear back. But yes, that those 19, that the 2020 determinations uh, are, are based upon 2019 participation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pritchett, Dr. Kenick Schneck. Other, um, other reflections, comments, questions, concerns? Yeah, I'd like to comment. Sorry. OK, I think very I good. It's neither. But unfortunately, I can't see. Um, maybe you can't see it. Um, I'm having difficulties today. I've been booted off multiple times, so sorry about that. Um, Scott, I just wanted to say thank you for your presentation. Um, it's sort of a theme that we need to continue to carry and move forward. The idea of celebrating every success, however small or large. And so I feel like the, the presentation focuses on that and that's good because that's what that's what we need to hear. Um, knowing that it's it's sort of based on pre-pandemic uh, circumstance, um, and I'm, I'm probably going to sound like a broken record in the coming months, which is fine with me. <laughs> I feel like we need to make sure that we're not taking our eye off the ball um, so that we can retain that success and build upon it. Um, determination being a central topic um, that we need to continue to go back to. I wonder how many students don't necessarily fit in the category of at risk or even, you know, the creative sort of relatively successful in just about any arena type of students. There's just such a large number of students in the middle there that may not have been determined or had an IEP pre previous to the pandemic, but were sitting on a fence or possibly should have actually had one. Um, and that doesn't include the students that are at risk as a result of a pandemic. So I'm wondering how we are going to tailor our goals for a strategic plan during this time. 
for kids with um, that may not have established disabilities, but do have educational needs in this environment or did have them, we just didn't identify them and weren't really honoring the need that they had before, which does happen. I, I know it's a negative um, statement that we don't all like to sometimes hear, but it's a reality. Um, so celebrate the success. How can we um, transfer that success to a time such as this? Yeah, I'm not sure if you're looking for a response or if that was just a comment, but my response would be COVID is going to obviously be extremely challenging. Um, obviously, to your point, uh, these determinations are pre-COVID. Um, we know that the, the pandemic is going to, only going to make things more difficult, um, not only for our students who are currently diagnosed, as you refer to, but also to students who may have been in the, in the pipeline to be diagnosed or that will be diagnosed post-COVID. Post -COVID. It's, it's undoubtedly going to pose a tremendous challenge. What are some, I mean, you know, as, as parents, right, we often say, okay, what, let's brainstorm and think in advance. You know, I'm sitting here thinking, how can parents be empowered to get tutors or um, have access to tutoring for their kid that's learning remotely in this environment? So there are different universities around the state. There's care.com, uh, you know, Governor Whitmer had created a platform, if you will, for frontline workers that were trying to access childcare when they were um, continuing to go to work. So, you know, trying to be very laser focused in this respect, just to address the here and now, knowing that later is coming. Um, what can we do to get local school districts some form of structure to provide for these kids the best we can? Um, is my thought process. And, you know, if we have if we have a network of um, caregivers that we really encourage frontline workers to engage in, do we have a network of um, educational people that might not be returning to work on some level and, and they're really at risk, but they could be definitely a resource to a family in need, if you will. So is there a way to really streamline that as soon as possible for families to engage in. You know, currently at the state level, we don't have a system like that in place. If I'm understanding what you're asking or, or, or explaining in terms of connecting families to perhaps retired educators or educators who aren't returning to work, we don't have a system like that in place. Um, at the local level, I'm not sure how or if local school districts are, um, are um, are, are going down that road or are providing that service. Um, we, we do, to your point, on the child care front, we do on the child care front um, have been able to uh, to work with the governor's office and others in terms of, of making sure that folks have quality child care as they return. Um, but that's different than obviously a, 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 a teacher that may be going into a home. Sure, right. And if you think about it, um, a tutor, an educational support, a teacher, um, that person uh, could potentially really walk by someone, even if it's an hour, um, a couple times a week. And I know this sounds pretty like minute, but, you know, again, we, we were able to create such a concept um, when it came to child care in those early months. I think we can do that now with educational supports for families and kids that need it. Again, that might not have been identified or determined, um, which would help minimize the gap that is growing. So just I throw it out there passionately. <laughs> Other, uh, thank you, Ms. Snyder. Other questions or comments from board members? Questions or comments from board members? Um, comment. Ms. Vecto. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, so uh, kind of picking up on what uh, Nikki was saying, um, I know that post pandemic um, there 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 is going to be a the a why I think a, a an incredible gap um, and loss, you know, f for special number of special ed students, particularly those who, um, you know, working on a computer, um, that kind of thing is just not. Um, cutting it you know it's um you know if they need certain kinds of therapies or if they're just not able to attend to um being on a computer for prolonged periods of time um and 
you know, I've I've heard um, that there are some some that want to go to hold the state harmless so that or not necessarily our state, but any state harmless for the lost for these children so that no further uh, funding or money would be necessary or to, to try to bring them um, where they should be. And I would urge against that and instead look for um, you know, proactive ways to find um, and start thinking about that now. What can be done? What investment can the state make in these families and these children? Understanding that they're going to be especially vulnerable and especially um, losing and, and, and these sorts of things. So, you know, while I understand that we're, it's a difficult situation and what can be done right now, given, you know, how contagious the the COVID is and one on one is so difficult. Um, I think we should not look for uh, just uh, wiping the slate clean and not providing these children and their families, these students and their families, some sort of um, extra support and services when, when as soon as we can. Yeah, I would concur. In, in the most recent guidance document that we put out in uh, in late June, early July, um, got to that uh, effect, Michelle. Is, um, we really encourage districts to look into what we call recovery services, um, to work with parents, to your point, um, and families, um, and take a look at the needs of the student, um, where the student's at, uh, what they didn't receive, perhaps, um, right. and provide, again, what we are calling recovery services. Um, right. And, and that that's a, it's a method that... That's a method yeah. that many other states are also um, are encouraging as well. That's great. So this would circumvent like because um, I was told at one point that if a, per a parent wanted services, they would have to actually file a complaint against the school, say the school somehow did something wrong and the schools aren't doing anything wrong. They just it's just impossible to do what's needed. So I'm, I'm hoping to that it's an approach that won't be adversarial, that won't have to be a complaint against a school that you don't necessarily feel has been a you know, uh, a bad actor. You just feel the 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 state as a whole and the, the the school system as a whole should be acknowledging and addressing um, the the extra loss that these students have um, experienced. So, so there is there is it would this be a way to circumvent or to get services without having to file any sort of complaint? Yeah, I wouldn't use the term circumvent because, as you know, a parent can file a, a state complaint um, at any time. Um, and so that's always their right. But to your point, the guidance that we released um, is exactly what you talked about. We, 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 we're encouraging districts to be proactive, um, to be collaborative, to reach out to parents. Um, and again, have a conversation about what we're calling recovery services, which are different than compensatory services, which come, to your point, after a special education complaint. Um, so we're not trying to circumvent, we're trying to encourage districts to be proactive um, and collaborative and, and really address this upfront. Um, um, perhaps. Is there, any, is there any additional state funding or is that gonna be just on the school district's general, you know, general funds? To, to there, do that. there are no additional funds appropriated by our state legislature at this time to, to provide these. Districts can use CARES dollars um, to provide recovery services. And as you know, those are the federal dollars that we received. Okay, great. I, I would encourage that hopefully the legislature would, people in the legislature would care about this issue and address it in the next round for the for budgets. But thank you. You bet. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fecto. Ms. Snyder, a question. Yes, I'm just curious. Has the process changed in terms of requesting an IEP or, or 504 for families? Is that something that they can still engage in um, mm -hmm. during the pandemic? Yes, it hasn't changed and our guidance um, has, has addressed those issues. We can still, I say we, local districts can still hold virtual IEPs um, and, and there are still ways to um, to start and finish that process. So that has not changed. Other uh, other questions or comments from board members? Questions or comments from board members? Hearing and seeing none, uh, Dr. Kennex Connect, uh, thank you very much. Congratulations thank you. on the good work. Thank and you. I will communicate that directly with Ms. Rink when we speak later this afternoon. Thank you. Um, thank you.
Uh, I believe that we are working on getting our uh, professor um, with us. If you could just hold for one quick moment. And uh, in the interim, President Obrich, um, why don't we move to uh, why don't we move to a uh, vote on the meeting minutes while we're while we're waiting? Could I please have a motion to approve the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting of June 9th, 2020? So oh. I've got a motion. Could I have a second? Second. Second. Uh, could we have a roll call vote, please, Marilyn? Yes. Vectel? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. yes. Pugh? Yes. yes. Ramos Montini? Ramos Montini? Yes. Thank you. Snyder? Yes. Tilly is saying yes. Albrich? Yes. Thank you, everyone. 8 0. Motion carries. Thank you very much, uh, Marilyn. Um, let's move to the report of the president. Uh, president Albrich, do you have a report for us? Oh, it will be very, very brief. Um, I just wanted to highlight, first of all, I hope everyone had a wonderful summer. Uh, well, as best as we can uh, under these trying times. And um, welcome back. Special welcome to our new Michigan Teacher of the Year and a special um, departing words for our former, soon to be former Michigan Teacher of the Year, uh, who did a fantastic job this year and we really appreciate her all the work that she did. Um, and I just wanted to highlight the fact that I believe this is the week that school districts are required to provide their fall plans, which we're about to have a conversation about. Um, just wanted to to mention just how much work our local school boards and the educators and the parents and the taxpayers and community members have have engaged in over the last six weeks, coming up with these plans, um, very difficult decisions and different across the board. Some of them are going um, remote learning, at least for the interim thesis. Others are doing face to face. Others are doing some blended. Um, and, and unfortunately, no matter what the decision is, there's going to be people who are very unhappy about it and there will be people who are very happy about it. Um, but out of both necessity and commitment, our local districts and our educators and our parents and others um, are making very tough decisions. And I just want to say how much I and I believe the board and MDE appreciate the work that they've done over the last six weeks. Thank you, President Albrich. Um, we do have um, Professor Strunk uh, here. Um, let me uh, share a brief introduction uh, for uh, her presentation. Our next presentation is being uh, done by Dr. Catherine Strunk, Director of the Education Policy Innovation Collaborative at Michigan State University. She's here to share her findings both on an analysis of continuity of learning plans from the spring and the teacher and principal survey results from the spring. So these are foundational elements that have helped our uh, local school districts reflect upon the work that they are doing in the summer and the fall to serve children in the next school year. Uh, Dr. Strunk, welcome. Uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Rice. Can everybody hear me since I'm sort of calling in separately? Yes. Great. OK, well, thank you for inviting me to speak with you all today. I appreciate it. As I believe you all know, EPIC at MSU is an independent nonpartisan research center that we operate as a strategic partner to Michigan, Michigan Department of Education. And I'm, as Dr. Rice said, we'll be sharing with you some of our findings about Michigan School District's initial plans to continue educating students in the spring of 2020 and principals and teachers perceptions of this instruction and schooling and the impact of COVID on students during that time. Thank you, Mark, for being willing to advance my slides for me and I can go to the next one. So in this presentation, I'm going to address three main research questions. I should say that both of the reports that um, this presentation are based on are on our website and at the end I'll provide the link, but they're just on Epic Ed Policy's website so you can get them yourself. 
we will talk about what, what plans did school districts put into place for finishing the 2019-20 school year after the suspension of face-to-face -face instruction, how did principals and teachers respond to the transition to distance learning, and how might the pandemic and associated suspension of face-to-face -face instruction have differential impacts on different groups of students? Next slide, please, Mark. To begin to answer these questions, we collected a lot of data. Uh, we want to thank MDE and our other partners from across the state for helping us do this. We coded all 813 continuity of learning plans that were provided to MDE in the spring. As you all know, Exec Executive Order 2020, 35, and 65 required plans to describe 14 yes. elements of operations. We coded for all of them, including the mode of instruction, monitoring student learning, maintaining relationships with students, and ensuring access to learning for all students. Um, we also, again, did a survey of about 9,000 educators, K-8 through teachers and principals in May through June of 2020. We focused on K-8 because we tacked this survey on to the already existing survey in the field that were to study the read by grade three laws implementation. So we don't have high schools in this picture here for the surveys, but we know that other folks across the state have done a similar survey for high school students. Um, we merged these data to the longitudinal data set from CEPI and MBE to look at how things differed across sector, locale of district, and student demographic composition in terms of proportion of kids who are economically disadvantaged or from underrepresented minority groups and average student achievement in the district. And we also looked at the U.S. Census data in the terms of the proportion of households with broadband internet subscriptions in a given district. Next slide, please, Mark. Here's a little bit more on our survey sample. As I said, we had about 9,000 responses from K-8 educators from about 90% of Michigan school districts. This map shows you where they are, so you can see that they are a good representation across the whole state. We had response rates of about 16% for eligible teachers and 12% for principals. This is lower than we would normally like, but we think that there are extenuating circumstances this spring, so we understand why we had this low response rate. Um, the survey sample is representative of Michigan's educators. So we have a, there are a few differences or slightly more proportions of respondents who are female, who are hired in the last five years, who are elementary certified or endorsed in ELA. Next slide, please. I wanna start with a couple of caveats before I jump into the data. We coded district's initial continuity of learning plans. We were not able to code any kind of final plan that they might've produced after April nor the actual implementation of those plans. We know that districts um, learned and evolved a lot as the semester unfolded, and they probably implemented things that were not in their initial plans. We couldn't code for that. Uh, in addition, survey responses are always limited by the questions we can ask and who answers them and when they answer them. So we wanted to keep the survey purposely short so that we didn't overburden teachers and principals. So we couldn't ask everything. We would always welcome feedback from you, and we always ask MDE, and they've been wonderful in providing us feedback to help us understand what else you might want to ask in future iterations. So we will continue to work with MDE to understand instruction and learning during the pandemic as we go back to school. Next slide, please, Mark. I'm going to just start with something that I think is not going to be surprising to any of us. When we asked teachers and principals about what they were concerned about in terms of the impact of COVID-19, they expressed deep concern about the ways in which the suspension of face-to-face -face instruction would impact students' learning and well-being. This graph has a lot going on. So the panel on your left shows teachers' responses, and the panel on your right shows principals' responses. The x-axis at the bottom shows a proportion of educators who responded that they were not at all concerned, somewhat concerned, concerned, or extremely concerned, with gray indicating non-response. For each set of educators, teachers, and principals, we centered the X axis at zero, showing to the right the proportion of educators who were concerned or extremely concerned in green and dark blue, and to the left the proportion of educators who were only somewhat or not at all concerned in teal and purple. You can see the extent of concern by the size of the combined green and dark blue bars to the right of the center line on each panel. And each bar represents an item we asked in our survey of educators, so to what extent they were concerned about each of these things. For both teachers and principals, you can see that the far majority of educators were concerned about students missing instructional time, students returning to school behind in literacy and other content areas, the long-term economic impact on students, students missing crucial services and supports, and supporting students through their grief and trauma. They were also worried about how to maintain and build relationships with students and barriers preventing students from accessing remote learning and literacy learning, as well as how to adapt curriculum for at-home remote learning. 
Fewer educators were concerned for themselves relative to their students, although still nearly 60% of teachers and principals worried about the long-term economic impacts for themselves, and the majority were concerned about barriers that might prevent them from providing instruction remotely. Next slide, please, Mark. When we look at how districts plan to provide instruction in the spring of 2020, we see that the far majority, approximately 80%, plan on providing primarily virtual or hybrid instruction. We defined hybrid as those districts that had plans that discussed using both virtual and hard copy resources to educate their students. Only 11% of districts plan to use primarily hard copy media, and a small proportion outlined plans to vary instructional modality by grade level. Next slide. So here I flipped the graph on its side so we can examine districts' primary mode of instruction by the proportion of their population that had broadband internet access. Um, this is the same data as we saw in the last slide in the top bar, and then the second through the bottom bar show the distribution of planned instructional modality for districts with low, medium, and high levels of broadband access. We see that districts, that the planned use of virtual instruction varies by broadband internet access. So districts and communities with low levels of connectivity were less likely to plan to offer virtual or hybrid instruction, whereas those in communities with higher levels of connectivity plan to rely more on virtual or hybrid instruction. Next slide, please. I don't show it here for time, but our survey results make very clear that teachers and principals believe that better internet access and to devices for students would be helpful. So this graph shows that the far majority of districts in their plans plan to provide electronic devices and internet access to at least some students. The top panel shows the proportion of plans that say they will provide students with electronic devices, and the bottom is the same for internet access. The green bar showed the plans that said they would do so for every student, and the blue bars indicate for at least some students. And you see this again varies across districts. So here we show that urban districts were the most likely to plan to offer at least some students' devices and internet access, and rural districts were less likely to do so. It seems a little counterintuitive, and similarly counterintuitively, the right panel shows that districts with the highest community broadband access were the most likely to plan to offer devices and internet access. Next slide, please. We asked teachers to tell us about some of the challenges that they faced in transitioning to distance learning and instruction. Teachers reported substantial challenges with technology and virtual instruction. Over three quarters of teachers said that consistent internet access for students was a challenge to a moderate or to a great extent. And nearly three quarters of teachers also expressed that facilitating student participation in virtual class activities and a lack of technology training for students were challenges. They also felt that facilitating student-to-student -student interaction in a virtual class setting was hard, as was the lack of available technology for students and a lack of technology training for remote learning tools. Next slide, please. One of the most frequent challenges expressed by teachers was keeping their students engaged in their schoolwork, which you see in the top set of bars, and student attendance, which were in the bottom set of bars. So interestingly, this was especially the case for teachers with students in older grades, as can be seen by the differences in the purple bars, sixth through eighth grade students, and in the dark blue bars for the K through third grade students. Next slide, please. So when we asked teachers how they engage students during remote instruction, we found that most reported using online and virtual instruction and fewer sent physical learning resources home. The top bar shows that 83% of teachers reported regularly sending electronic resources via student or parent emails or other online communication. Three quarters of teachers reported contacting students individually to check in, and two thirds of teachers reported regularly holding virtual office hours and holding virtual classes with their entire classroom. Fewer teachers reported regularly sending home physical learning resources such as homework packets or books, and only about one third reported regularly holding virtual tutoring sessions with small groups or one on one. Next slide, please. So, one of the things that we know from research about remote instruction is that it's critical to engage and educate students by providing them with direct instruction. So providing students with live and high quality learning experiences, even when they're not face-to-face -face in school buildings. But this is incredibly hard to do. And we see from the continuity of learning plans, the district's plans for providing student instruction suggest less direct engagement than would be the case in a typical school day and year. So the graph on the left shows that approximately 44% of districts specified in their plans that students would receive direct instruction which we defined as instructional activities where students are learning directly from the teacher, including both synchronous and asynchronous activities. This was far more likely to be planned to occur in urban districts and less so in rural districts. 
only 9% of plans actually specified the hours of lessons with direct instruction. And of that sample, the average amount of direct instructional time was about 11 hours per week or five to six, five to six lessons per week. 16% of plans specified expected time on independent learning and schoolwork, averaging about 12 hours per week. Again, rural districts plan for fewer hours and lessons of direct instruction, and district plans outline less instructional time for students in younger grades. Next slide, please. So, of course, schools are about more than academic learning, and the continuity of learning plans made clear that most districts intended for teachers to have frequent contact with and to provide feedback to students, even as buildings were closed. So the green bars in this graph show the proportion of district plans that indicated that teachers would have check-in meetings with students. So nearly all school districts, I think 92%, specified that teachers must regularly connect with students, and the far majority did so through teacher check-ins with students or via one-on-one -on -one meetings. The dark blue bars show the planned frequency of check-ins with the far majority of districts planning for weekly check-ins. And the teal bars on the right show that districts plan for check-ins to have multiple uses. Nearly half of plans indicated that teachers were to use check-in meetings as a way of maintaining social connections with their students. And similarly, about half expected teachers to use this time to check on the socio-emotional and mental health of their students. Meetings were also used to provide feedback about student learning. Next slide, please. So a little bit more about feedback on learning activities. Again, this is a critical component of remote instruction. And over 80% of districts that relied primarily on virtual instructional methods specified that they would provide feedback on learning activities, as is shown in the green bar on the left, compared to about 60% of districts that relied primarily on hard copy instructional methods in the blue bars. The kind of feedback provided also varies by urbanicity and the proportion of underrepresented minority students in the district. Next slide, please. An important means of feedback are grade. So we found that districts intended to be very flexible with their final grading policies. About 43% of plans explicitly indicated that at least some students would receive final grades for the year. We're of course sure that more districts had policies than were shown in the plans, but these are the ones that reported it out in the initial plan. Of that 43%, about three quarters of these districts used a binary or categorical grading system, such as pass, no pass, or complete, incomplete. About one third used what we call a no harm grading policy by which students could not get a lower grade than they had when the school buildings were closed. And 6% of plans said that students could be retained if they did not earn a passing grade. <clears throat> Next slide, please. One of the most critical issues that I think was just addressed in the previous presentation facing districts and schools was how to provide high quality education and distance learning for special populations of students, and in particular for students with IEPs or 504 plans and English learners. Also, given the state's focus on literacy, early literacy, we were concerned about early, uh, the, the ability to provide instruction to students who were struggling with literacy in the early years. <clears throat> so in this slide, we compare teachers' reported challenges with continuing to provide supports and services to these populations and to students who were uh, with accommodations provided in the district's initial continuity of learning plan. So we see that nearly two-thirds of teachers reported challenging challenges with con con continuing to provide supports to students with IEPs and 504 plans, and 70% of district plans specified that they were going to accommodate these students. 39% of teachers reported challenges with continuing to provide supports for ELs, whereas only a quarter of continuity of learning plans specified accommodations for these students. Interestingly, about 69% of teachers reported challenges with continuing to provide access to literacy intervention services. And only 4% of plans addressed accommodations for students with what are called reading deficiencies under the Read by Grade 3 law, or kids who had individualized reading intervention plans. Next slide, please. The transition to remote instruction was not easy for educators, and I think that's been made fairly evident. Um, so here we look at how districts said in their continuity of learning plans that they would provide PD for teachers and what teachers said they needed in terms of support and PD. We found discrepancies between districts' plans to offer professional development and what teachers said they needed. So first, only 27% of districts mentioned dist distance learning focused PD for teachers whereas three quarters of teachers indicated in the surveys that virtual training resources would be very helpful. Next slide, please. So we asked kind of some specifics about what resources would be helpful to educators to provide remote instruction. And principals and teachers were fairly aligned in what they responded. In particular, over three quarters of educators wanted models of digital classroom practice, virtual training resources on how to effectively use digital learning strategies, 
digital platforms that provide learning content and ready-made lessons to deliver online. This is kind of shown by the dark blue and green bars, again, to the right of the 0% line for the principals and teachers. Next slide. I'm cognizant of time, so the last thing I wanna to highlight today before closing is the importance of students' mental health and social well-being during this pandemic. Both teachers and principals expressed substantial concerns about their students during the spring of 2020. These are just highlighting what I showed at the very top of this presentation. Over 80% of educators were concerned about students missing crucial services and supports while school buildings were closed. And the far majority were concerned with supporting students through their grief and trauma related to COVID-19 and with the long-term impacts, economic impact of the pandemic on their students. Next slide, please. So districts plan to support student well-being in a variety of ways. Nearly every single plan, 99.6% of them, specified ways to address student socio-emotional learning and our mental health needs, including by providing access to site counselors and other mental health professionals and referrals to outside resources. Um, the plans also indicated that districts would provide students with opportunities to socialize with their peers. They would incorporate socio emotional mental health into their curricula and they would provide a directory of community resources or referrals to outside resources. Next slide, please. So I'm happy to talk about what I think the key takeaways are with all of you, but I wanted to kind of hit on five important points first. One of the things that I think is pretty evident in this presentation and in both of the reports that are online is that kids across the state in different kinds of districts received very different treatment, very different um, education in the, in the spring. And so we need to make sure that we're keeping equity of opportunity at the forefront when we're planning for high quality instruction in the 2021 school year. Part of doing this is equipping all students with the necessary learning materials to allow them to fully engage in remote instruction, whether that is virtual or hard copy materials. We also need to make sure we're continuing to focus our efforts on both instruction and student support services, particularly for kids in lower achieving or economically disadvantaged districts. We should try to build on the current efforts that districts are doing to provide direct instruction and frequent contact between students and teachers, even if they're not able to be face-to-face -face in the school building. And part of doing this is expanding access to virtual training and distance learning resources for our teachers and our principals so that they are able to best provide high quality instruction in whatever format their districts do. I'm gonna end there. Next slide, please, Mark. It should be a green epic slide. And there's the link at the bottom with where we have it on our website, all these reports, and also my own contact information. And I'm, of course, happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, uh, Professor Strunk, for your presentation and for your analysis that preceded the presentation. Board members, questions or comments? So I see some faces, but I don't necessarily know if they are accompanied by questions and comments. Uh, Dr. Pritchett, a comment? I just wanted to say I, I appreciate the um, report. I had an opportunity not to read it in depth, but to read the uh, entire report. The information is very helpful, um, especially as we are starting to look at the beginning of this year and some lessons that we need to learn uh, because um, we know that we are going to be in this situation for several more months. So, um, but we, those lessons that we're learning, I think need to be even taken into consideration. Something like as we had the conversation about the strategic plan this morning, just not until the quote unquote end of the pandemic, whenever that happens, because I think we learned a lot from, um, you know, we've got uh, an opportunity here uh, to uh, reach students in all sorts of different ways. Uh, and uh, this information at least gives us some uh, starting point. So I appreciate the effort that went into it uh, and uh, have found it uh, extremely insightful um, you know, you kind of live in your own little uh, world as far as, well, maybe I'm observing this or I'm hearing this from my peers uh, in my own little world, but this kind of put it at a statewide level. So I appreciate the effort that went into it. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Pritchett. Other uh, comments or questions? Comments or questions from board members? Virtual hands or real hands? Dr. Pugh, a comment? Well, probably more of a question. And I know that, that I believe that, that uh, you presented this to the one of the legislative committees. And I began to watch it and I had to jump off. So I, I just wanted off, to sorry. which one of the response was. Uh, how, how was the response to this? I'm sorry, I was unable to hear your whole question. It feels like you might have broken it. Like you might have broken it, it, right. It looks like some things are acting goofy here. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So my question is, I, I began, I believe that this is the same presentation that was presented to one of the legislative committees. And I was just wondering what the response was to you and Dr. Rice's uh, uh, presentation to the legislature. Did you hear me? A, no. Yep, yep, I got that. Thank you. This is a similar presentation. It's not the exact same. We didn't have this survey results in the previous presentation to the Senate Education Committee. They didn't have any questions for me, although I think that they were taking time to read it. They didn't have the report in advance. Dr. Rice, did you want to? They had more questions for Dr. Rice's presentation. Well, and so, and so, um, uh, Professor Strunk presented on the continuity of learning plan analysis, not the teacher and principal survey um, analysis. So the one versus the other. Their, their comment uh, to Dr. Strunk was, while this is a lot of information, it's going to take time to, um, to go over. Um, so it is really a rich document, and I think it reflects not only um, where people were in the spring, but by extension, the springboard off of which they are uh, creating and having approved plans in the summer for the fall. So it really, it really helps us understand um, kind of what they're moving from in the um, in the spring. But no, we did not get a lot of feedback on uh, Professor Strunk's presentation at the Senate Committee a few weeks ago. And, and can we go back to the last slide? And I, I couldn't locate the slides myself, so I, I did not get a chance to, to pull them up. I just wanted to go back to your last point. I just want to make sure that I that I saw that. Sure, I think Mark Howe is helping me out with this. So Mark is okay, in there. Yes, I do see it. Um, so, I, you know, one, one of my concerns right now in looking at expanded access to virtual training and distance learning resources for educators is the fact that we're so focused on getting children back into brick and mortar, getting them back into um, the school buildings that they it, it feels as if we've not um, put enough emphasis on that last point that that you're making here. And I don't know if that's necessarily a question for you or, or the, the department. I mean, I can jump in and just say, I think it's critical. So again, teachers were not trained to do this. This is not what they learned in their programs or really even since. And so if there's any chance that we're gonna be teaching virtually any number of days of the week, however many months this goes on, it's gonna be really important to provide high quality training to the teachers to be able to provide high quality instruction to their kids. All right, and, and so I guess this, this this is maybe where I interject my my thoughts, you know, on that, on this whole conversation of um, opening school doors or virtual, and we have schools right now, uh, here in Saginaw at least, I'm, you know, we're getting news that other schools are going to, face, are not going to do face to face. So, it, you know, I think that it's unfortunate that there wasn't, and this this isn't new, Dr. Rice, you and I have had this conversation, that school districts have not had the guidance um, from a state level. And I do understand that this is something new. I understand that MDE plays a role in this, the governor's office plays a role in this, and Department of Health and Human Services um, plays a role in this. But, you know, just having better guidance, and I think that, that again, it's just, I, I think that most schools should 
be able to have the opportunity and be encouraged to do just what that last point says, which is to um, be able to really focus in on that virtual learning uh, piece because this is new and we did have to rush to do this. Um, and now we might be right back at, at where we were before is again rushing to figure out how we're going to extend virtual learning to students. Um, and I just wish that there was better guidance on this from from the state level. There has been uh, Dr. Pugh, thank you for sharing that. There's been an enormous amount of guidance that's been offered and an enormous amount of professional development, but there is quite a bit left to provide. If you look at Michigan Virtual, for example, Michigan Virtual provided um, about 150,000 uh, professional development sessions um, over the last six months um, associated with sketches, about a third of the continuing education uh, credits that were offered within the state were offered by Michigan Virtual on uh, virtual learning. We're a strong partner of Michigan Virtual. We've co-published with Michigan Virtual. We've amplified their work. Michigan Virtual has amplified our work. We've put out guidance as a department in this area. Others have put out guidance uh, from their organizations, MASA, MAISA, MASB, uh, MASSP. Uh, but there's no question that there's more to be done. Absolutely no question, but that there is more to be done. Um, it's hard to pivot from an in-person environment to um, a remote environment, let alone a remote environment with the connectivity and with the computers. So we acknowledge that there's a lot more to be accomplished, um, not only um, within the department, but also within the ed orgs, uh, within the nonprofits, within the uh, ISDs and within the local school districts. I can tell you there's an enormous amount of work that's being done in this area and much more that still needs to be done. I, I guess if I could just add, you know, I, and, and it, it, it's, it's not a finger pointing at all, but well, I guess I could. The, you know, I think having the pressures of a uh, president and a secretary of education and now unfortunately a legislature that's forcing people to go to school and people are scrambling uh, without the necessary resources or support or guidance to do so, um, knowing that it, and also protecting children and, and um, educators and uh, the, the people who come in contact with, with each of them. And I just think that it, it, it has done more harm to put those pressures that are not able to be, uh, again, met, uh, opening doors and keeping children safe. Uh, we just saw a report that came out yesterday that 90%, there's a 90% increase in, in young, in children uh, who, coronavirus cases in children in the, in over the last four weeks. Um, so I guess saying that, um, I just think that the infrastructure has not been there for superintendents, for school districts, for school boards to be able to make decisions that are not under that pressure of you better open or you're not going to get your funding. Um, and I think that there's just a lot of confusion and I'm just hoping that we here at this state table with the governor's office, you um, and Brandy, who are part of the uh, the that that group that formed, um, if there's any way that we can help to provide better guidance uh, to districts to be able to put more focus in this area. So not just for the educators, I guess moving it beyond to make sure that 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 the local districts have. The, the where the, have all of the information as well as the, the are relaxed to be able to make those decisions. OK, thank you very much for uh, for sharing that. It, I will tell you that there are a lot of cross cutting um, elements here and uh, the clarity from the feds is um, is certainly insufficient and it affects what we do in individual states. 
uh, but also the newness of this. Uh, we're learning, we're providing guidance um, collectively on the fly, and um, uh, those lessons learned from partners like uh, Professor Strunk um, and others help us to build um, better systems for our kids subsequently. Uh, Brandy, would you care to share anything on that? No? Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Um, other um, other comments or questions from board members to uh, Professor Strunk? Other comments or questions? Going once, twice, and thrice. Hearing and seeing none. Uh, Dr. Strunk, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, we, will, we will see you soon. Thank you. Take care. You as well. So board members, we have um, completed um, the presentation on continuity of learning plans in the spring surveys. The next item on today's agenda is approval of standards for the preparation of teachers in middle grades and high school, professional knowledge and skills, English language arts and mathematics. The standards for the preparation of teachers in professional knowledge and skills, English language arts and mathematics in middle grades, five through nine and high school, seven through 12, were presented to the State Board of Education during its February 11th meeting and followed by a period of comment through April of 2020. These standards will replace Michigan's current preparation standards for teachers in English and mathematics in grades 6 through 12. Today the board is being asked to approve the standards. Pending board approval, technical assistance will be provided by the Office of Educator Excellence to educator preparation institutions on program review and redesign to align to the state standards. Presenters are Dr. Vanessa Kiesler, Deputy Superintendent of Educator, Student and School Supports, and Dr. Sean Kotke, Education Consultant Manager in the Office of Educator Excellence. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Rice. And thank you all. Um, I think that intro really covered all of our front matters, so I'm just going to kick it over to Dr. Kotke to take us through the presentation. Okay, great, thank you. Let me share my screen. I hope you're seeing my PowerPoint slide. Yes, okay, good. <laughs> we'll go ahead <clears throat> and, and get started. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, it's a pleasure to come before you uh, to share uh, the results of public comment on these standards and seek your uh, approval uh, for these uh, documents. So a little context, uh, why are we reviewing new teacher preparation standards now? Uh, we had certification changes in 2018 uh, and our preparation changes then that accompany that uh, to enable to enact that new certificate structure are ongoing and include today's uh, revised standards. Accompanying this uh, also are placement changes and placement guidance changes um, and public comment on those also took place during the time that we had public comment on these standards. Uh, that is being summarized uh, to be brought forward at a later date uh, this fall. Some definitions and, and why it's important to talk this out is some of the public comment um, conflated preparation and placement uh, and, and flexibilities. And so it's good to lay out some of what we're talking about when we talk about these different terms. So preparation is simply the standards and, and clinical experiences that comprise an educator's program of study. Uh, certification or licensure is the physical, uh, or in this case virtual often, uh, document that demonstrates an educator has met the legal requirements to be an educator um, and identifies the content areas and, and grade ranges in which they've been prepared. Placement is our state guidelines that indicate how an educator may be assigned under a valid certificate or license. 
and flexibilities are additional assignment opportunities under a valid permit uh, authorization or uh, approval for educators who are either certified or uncertified when the ideal uh, candidate is not available. The focus, of course, today is on uh, preparation. Uh, under appropriate placement in the prior staffing system, uh, teachers were appropriately placed when they were teaching solely in the area in which they were prepared, and that endorsement was listed on their certificate. Uh, additional op flexibilities were available via our permit system. Under the new staffing system, uh, preparation and certification uh, do not always equal placement and flexibilities, or do not always equal what's possible under placement and, and flexibilities. Put simply, what's written on the certificate does not comprehensively reflect what a teacher uh, is able to teach. And so to accompany our cert structure and uh, the standards for each of the grade bands, uh, we developed expanded appropriate placement guidelines with stakeholder input. Uh, and part of those guidelines involve placement of teachers uh, which can occur outside their area of preparation and certification in specific circumstances. There would then be also additional flexibilities uh, available for those placements using our permit system. Uh, as noted, public comment on that appropriate placement proposal has closed uh, and will be presented to you uh, later in the season. So I can shift back to today's focus. Uh, we have our standards for the preparation of teachers in the middle grades and in high school in their professional knowledge and skills, English language arts, and mathematics. Why are we implementing new standards now? Well, the previous teacher preparation standards in these areas uh, were adopted in 2000 based on stakeholder input and drafting that took place in the uh, five to seven years prior to that. Uh, and in the meantime, new K-12 standards uh, and assessments were adopted in 2010. So very simply, our expectations for the preparation of a teacher in English language arts and math uh, are not up to date with the K-12 expectations uh, and assessments. Uh, there's a degree of urgency uh, by uh, set by our um, state's literacy initiatives uh, it started with early grades, of course, uh, but then carry forward into the secondary level. And there were legislative allocations for upgrading teacher licensure tests a few years ago, uh, which we need new standards in order to build new tests. We can't just build new tests on old standards. So these standards uh, represent some key shifts in educator preparation uh, that accompany this new certificate structure. Uh, one is contextualized instructional practices are the focus of the standards. It is not a set of topics, uh, uh, just a decontextualized list of content that a teacher must be able to teach, but rather specific practices uh, in the content area uh, that will uh, lead to effective student learning. Um, as I noted, practice and content are, are much more integrated. As you read through the standards, you don't see lists of topics, but you rather see things teachers should know and then do uh, linked together. There's a strong focus on meeting the needs of individual students um, in throughout the, the sets of standards. Um, and accompanying these these standards and having been and have been presented to the board uh, previously are embedded ongoing clinical experiences. Now, research shows that focus preparation grounded in strong clinical experiences increases new teachers' abilities and their retention. Uh, I will note that in among the public comment, uh, that was a key theme raised by a few commenters that the more these standards are uh, delivered in a, an authentic context uh, and field experiences and clinical experiences for candidates, the better candidates will be prepared. 
So we've done the, the PK3 and the 3.6 standards adopted by the board in 2018. And so now we move to the 5.9 and 7.12 grade bands. And our initial focus here were on three areas, uh, professional knowledge and skills, uh, English language arts and mathematics. Uh, we chose these for several reasons. Uh, the professional standards, uh, these address key MDE priorities, especially whole child and social and emotional learning. Um, these are to be paired with all 5.9 and 7.12 endorsement areas to define expectations for foundational coursework uh, that teachers would uh, encounter in a preparation program. And so we lay that uh, down first. Uh, English language arts and math uh, among the four core content areas uh, were selected uh, as they address again key MDE priorities, especially literacy. The uh, K-12 content standards for both fields were updated in 2010, uh, and that represents these are the least most recent of uh, the four core content areas uh, in the these grade bands. Um, the teacher prep standards for both uh, were reviewed and updated uh, last in 2000, which means they were the, the furthest out of date. And we needed to define a continuum of teacher preparation expectations for the PK-12 classroom teacher before building standards for specialist roles in these areas. For example, uh, the reading specialist credential, which uh, has not changed since the year 2000. The timeline for development uh, of these standards proceeds thusly. Uh, core stakeholder writing groups began on each of these dates, October of 2018 for literacy, November 2018 for math, and then January 2019 for the professional knowledge and skills. And uh, the stakeholders met roughly twice monthly throughout uh, the spring of 2019 uh, and in the summer uh, of 2019 also. In all three cases, stakeholders were convened to review existing Michigan teacher preparation standards, uh, K-12 academic standards, and teacher preparation standards from other states and national professional organizations. Uh, in all cases, uh, current Michigan teacher preparation standards were deemed insufficient, and it was uh, all groups opted for drafting new standards, incorporating key ideas from multiple sources, um, as detailed in the introductory remarks to the standards document. These have been shared with external uh, stakeholders uh, for some feedback before our initial presentation to the board. Who participated in this? Uh, we had 73 contributors, not including MDE participants. They either worked on the core drafting team or submitted feedback. Uh, they include educator preparation provider researchers and faculty members, uh, general and special education teachers, uh, PK-12 administrators, ISD consultants, professional association leaders, and uh, parents and child advocates. We presented uh, the standards initially to you in uh, February of this year, and then between February and April solicited public comment. We had 201 stakeholders participate in the public comment survey. Now, it doesn't mean everybody offered a comment, but 201 people did participate in it. Uh, multiple perspectives uh, in order of frequency. Uh, we had teachers as our largest population, uh, school administrators are next, parents, interested citizens, educator preparation faculty, and those identifying themselves as uh, students. Uh, these stakeholders uh, were had an option to identify where what schools they represented, and we had 71 different ISDs, local school districts, PSAs, early childhood settings or colleges and universities uh, identified as uh, uh, represented in the uh, public comment. And 66 different professional educational organizations were identified. These range from state level uh, organizations in particular content areas, such as Michigan Council of Teachers of Mathematics, um, up to national organizations, such as the National Council of Teachers of English. It was an open response. Candidates, or I'm sorry, survey respondents could identify uh, as many or as few uh, professional organizations uh, with which they were affiliated. There were two core questions uh, on the test, on the sorry, on the survey. Uh, one, do you agree that the proposed standards for the preparation of teachers 
In professional knowledge and skills, English language arts and mathematics in middle grades will improve the preparation of teachers in middle grades. Uh, 70 percent uh, agreed with that statement, with only 22 percent uh, in disagreement. We have the same question for high school standards, so for the 712 standards, uh, and then 76 percent uh, indicated they agreed, and 24 percent uh, did not. Survey uh, respondents were then able to provide open-ended comments on, on the standards, and a number of key themes uh, emerged from these. Uh, the number one theme was support for the standards. Uh, more people responded with positive comments about the standards um, than about any of the other major topics uh, that, that came up. Uh, they praised many specific elements of the standards, uh, including the focus on contextualized instructional uh, instructional practices and uh, understanding uh, the lives of the students that they are teaching. Attention to the needs of English learners was another key uh, area. Uh, there were several commenters that felt there was not enough explicit attention to the needs of English learners uh, addressed in the context, uh, addressed in the standards. Um, and so uh, some changes were implemented to the standards in order to highlight that, uh, specifically in the English language arts standards. There were several places where there were implicit references to English learners, and those are made explicit uh, throughout to emphasize the need for an intentional focus on preparing uh, teacher candidates to support this population. Uh, mathematics standards uh, frequently reference all learners, which is intended to be inclusive of English learners, and therefore changes were not made in the math standards. Uh, teacher preparation programs are, however, advised to increase the curriculum's emphasis in this area. And technical assistance resources uh, will be provided to accompany these standards that further emphasize the inclusivity of the term all learners. Uh, that term also pops up in the professional standards uh, and the stakeholders who drafted the professional standards did not want to uh, unintentionally exclude uh, or give the impression of excluding uh, any population by providing an inventory of several different populations. Um, and so that, that is meant to be broadly inclusive. Uh, next theme was implementation and program considerations. So uh, these really focused in on um, the standards may not make a difference if they're not implemented well and the multiple candidates or mul multiple respondents had ideas for ways to implement it well which largely revolved around solid clinical experiences giving candidates maximum opportunities to work with authentic students in authentic school settings uh, to develop their knowledge and skills in these areas uh, the balance between uh, content knowledge and pedagogical training uh, was raised in the standards, both uh, uh, some thinking it was a, a great uh, a great balance between them and others thinking it erred more on the side of pedagogical training than in uh, defined content knowledge. There were some comments about the emphasis, uh, amount of emphasis on equity and advocacy uh, in the standards. Many of the supporting comments uh, in that first category praised the emphasis on equity and advocacy for students. Um, there were a couple of comments that did not think that the standards went far enough in preparing teachers to be advocates for equitable instruction. And then there were a couple of comments that did not feel that that was the proper province of teacher preparation, that, that teacher preparation should um, be just about the content. Uh, but the, the bulk of, of comments in this area were in support uh, of what is embedded in the standards. Uh, as I referenced earlier, uh, there was uh, concern uh, among some commenters about the impact of narrower grade bands on teacher shortages. Uh, some of those were not really about the 5, 9, and 712 grade bands, but really focused in on the PK3 and the 3-6. Uh, our, our response on that is the, the uh, flexibilities that will be within the appropriate placement proposal should address those concerns. Those concerns were not about the content of the standards. 
And uh, the last major area of comments was uh, general comments about the need to invest in teacher recruitment, retention, and ongoing professional learning that that would make a bigger impact on the quality of the teaching workforce than preparation standards. We do not disagree that those things are important. And so those comments were shared with the other uh, units within the Office of Educator Excellence that focus on recruitment, retention, and professional learning. So the next steps uh, provided uh, the board approves uh, the standards today are technical assistance to our educator preparation providers. Uh, we'd kick that off this fall. Uh, we anticipate then pre uh, preparation program review to take place uh, at the very beginning in spring of 2022, uh, and that the first cohorts would enter uh, new programs in the fall of 2023. We anticipate many of them entering as freshmen and hence candidates exiting programs in bulk in the spring of 2027. Although we know that candidates will probably uh, likely start some of these programs as juniors in the fall of 2023, which would allow them to be exiting the program at an earlier calendar uh, than that. And here is the contact information for the members of the educator preparation team for additional questions uh, regarding the standards. Uh, myself for anything related to English language arts, Dr. Gina Garner, uh, for anything related to the professional standards and uh, Darcy McMahon for uh, questions related to the mathematics standards. Thank you for your time and that concludes the active presentation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kiesler, Dr. Kotke. If we could, um, to kick this off, if we could have a motion uh, to approve, to begin the discussion. So moved. Uh, motion to approve on the table. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. Uh, we have a motion and a second discussion. Discussion from the board. Comments or questions? Certainly a, um, a rich area and a complicated uh, area. And I appreciate the work of the Office of Educator Excellence. Uh, this is um, much more complicated than meets the eye, uh, perhaps initially. There are a lot of moving parts to it, not simply uh, different subject areas, but different grade levels. Um, there are different aspects of the preparation uh, process. Um, and I think this is a, a remarkably clear presentation um, given the complexity involved. So I appreciate the work uh, that's been uh, that's been done. Uh, Mr. McMillan, a question. Yeah, I um, I think I brought this up back a few months ago when it came before us, but uh, on in ELA 1G and uh, ELA, it's on the 21st page of the PDF, mm -hmm. ELA point two A, uh, references to social justice and wanting teachers to be able to promote social justice. Um, are in here, and I guess I'd like to understand what your definition, you know, the, the makers of this, the definition is. I know um, that it's uh, quite a um, touch point uh, for some uh, people as to what, uh, what it means. So if we're going to have teachers promoting social justice, I'd like to know what that, uh, what, what that means. Sure. Dr. Kiesler, Dr. Kotke? Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, happy to uh, address that. Um, it, I can answer it with some reference to uh, a, a common theme throughout the standards, which is about understanding the backgrounds of all of the students that come to the classroom. So they're not just their identity backgrounds, um, but uh, as uh, race, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, uh, socioeconomic status, but also their language status. Their, uh, what, what, what are their home languages? What are their outside languages? The curriculum um, in, in English language arts, uh, but not exclusively in English language arts, uh, has been historically 
very narrowly focused and 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 accessible to only a certain profile of student to be successful that that the individual student either conformed to that uh, that norm uh, or or didn't and or failed uh, or, or worked really hard and so the curriculum was was very accessible to a limited spectrum of of our children when we talk about social justice in teacher preparation standards it's about expanding that circle of the curriculum making it accessible to all of our students uh, regardless of their backgrounds regardless of their home languages uh, in order that they have access to what comes next so we're, we're about providing them with i think ninth grade i'm thinking about providing uh, algebra i'm thinking about geometry for some of our advanced students i mean i think about pre-algebra for some of our less advanced students um, and if they don't get those foundations they don't move forward uh, and it's about expanding that circle of the curriculum in english language arts and also in mathematics uh, to allow all students an equal chance uh, to be successful. Um, okay, that's fine, you. but it's not defined here. So, I mean, I, I just know that it's a loaded term. Uh, it can mean redistribution of wealth. It could be uh, the reason why, yeah, I mean, people take from some and give to others. It's a, it's a very loaded term, and, and I brought it up last time. Um, it also, when we're talking about equitable societies, um, what exactly that means? I mean, there can be that can mean good things. That can mean uh, not so good things. If in order to make things equal, you got to you know take by force from some people and give it to others. So there's things in here I I just have concerns about. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, other um, other comments or uh, questions? Comments or questions? Uh, Ms. Secto, a question. Just unmuting. Um, OK, and I'm sorry, I didn't have the slides in front of me the whole time and I was kind of scrambling. So forgive me if you covered something and I'm re, you know, rehashing it. But on slide six, there was uh -huh. reference to placement of teachers outside of area of prep and certification. Does that mean that that will be allowed? Um, under, under certain circumstances. So uh, in, in the appropriate placement proposal, there is uh, an ideal level in which there is a 100% match between the content area and grade levels of a teacher's uh, certific certificate and the placement in which they're they're in, um, but then uh, uh, what would be um, we played with the language like also appropriate or allowable in certain circumstances uh, in the absence of say a teacher who is certified in uh, say ELA five nine, um, but you need a, a tenth grade ELA teacher to and can't find one to allow that person to step outside uh, the 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 strict bounds of their uh, what's on their certificate uh, and not incur a penalty um, not as a, a permanent measure um, but as a temporary measure uh, while uh, whilst searching for or supporting teachers in becoming properly certified in those content areas Okay, I, I, so are there certain parameters? Does this have to be approved by the department? Um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, Vanessa, if you'd like to, to speak to that, it, it is a proposal that does come uh, to the superintendent's office uh, for approval uh, and then uh, for presentation to uh, the state board uh, at that point. Okay, um, because I, I'm just remembering when I, when we had the EAA and I talked to dozens right. of teachers and they were certified. I mean, they were being, they're like high school teachers and then they would be going to elementary school and, you know, special ed teachers would be teaching, you know, they were, it was wildly out of their certification. You know, it was just, right. um, and then they could say, oh, all of our teachers are certified, but 
they weren't properly placed. Um, so I just my, that's I just don't want to I want to make sure that something like uh, sort of a free for all doesn't happen and that it's being monitored um, to <clears throat> to make sure that you know the kids are getting instruction from who they should be getting instruction from. Um, so if somebody wanted to cross like a whole different content area that would be allowed like if they were a math certified in math but a different grade you know it's not about they're certified in math would they be told they could teach science or social studies or is that would that be allowed yeah um thank you for the question so the appropriate placement work as we work through the certification and the standards for educator prep to go along with those certifications we also have to balance that with being in an era of teacher shortage a pretty profound teacher shortage in michigan and one that is potentially um, going to be Im impacted by the the current climate so having some flexibility for districts and educators and to meet student needs um, so to your point Ms. Fecto it's not a free-for-all necessarily uh, we want to have like Sean was saying ideal placement as well as allowable placement where you would not need to pull a permit um, we also have a pretty robust permitting structure so districts can ask can get a permit for teachers to teach a very different content area there are parameters under which they have to do that and we know that they're doing it there's a limit on time um you know but again it's you're you're finding the heart of the tension between high standards for preparation and certification deep preparation within um, narrower grade bands but the need to be able to fully staff and put certified and prepared educators in front of students so um, all these things taken together are meant to to balance those um, competing needs I, I would just, I mean, I can see going different grade levels maybe, but if it's completely different content area, that 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 raises a flag for me. If they're don't even, if they're not even versed in the content area that they're teaching, but um, so that's just a thought on that. The other, the other one is on slide eight. Um, let me go back to it. Mm. Um, eight. Um, 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 it, which was legally allowed upgrading. Oh, so the legislature is re requiring what stricter testing for teachers to become teachers. Is that what that reference legislative allocations for upgrading teacher licensure tests? I'm oh. not aware. Uh, good, good question. Thank you. Uh, there, there was an allocation about five years ago for um, uh, extra money to upgrade the all of our teacher licensure tests, uh, recognizing that many of them hadn't been updated um, in quite some time. Uh, and we agree that we, uh, we, we had some old test banks and out of date tests, um, but before we could uh, engage in uh, upgrading those tests, we needed to upgrade the standards on which those tests are based. So. OK, so that I just I know for a while there they had some pretty difficult tests and it was keeping teachers from entering the profession and I think it, they changed. Um, they were modified. Um, the other thing is um, in this in this preparation, um, you know, I'm just wondering how much um, I, I see there's there's 600 hours of a clinical work that's what's being recommended or mandated yeah it's part of our, our clinical experiences uh requirements um okay. six, 600 hours across across the arc of the program it includes student teaching okay that's a that's a one semester is that what my math is off that's like a half of a quarter or well uh, so 600 hours again is across the whole program so you'd have you have student teaching but you also have experiences prior to student teaching um, and so historically uh, teacher prep programs didn't necessarily have any clinical experiences prior to student teaching or very very limited uh, ones so what we're actually doing with those is ramping up the expectations leading up to student teaching okay so um, this is OK, pre teaching, pre yeah, pre student teaching. Um, and I'm wondering how much is um, it, in the standards addresses classroom management or 
um, just working with different students. Uh, I know you're saying it's all inclusive, but you know there's more inclusion of different kids of different abil abilities or different learners. Um, and if that's part of the um, of, of the standards, if that's addressed in the standards at all, so classroom management and then you know maybe working with kids who are included who might have an IEP. Is that, are the teachers um, given um, some uh, direction and guide, you know, training on that as well? Uh, yeah, um, the professional knowledge and skills uh, standards have um, standards related to creating uh, inclusive learning environments for, for understanding, you know, being able to enact students' IEPs. Um, the and, and accompanying the standards, uh, if you recall, um, last uh, and it's been two years now, uh, we shared uh, uh, core teaching practices. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and among the core teaching practices are a number of items that that would be classified under the, the rubric of, of classroom management. Um, so establishing norms and routines uh, for students um, and uh, being able to redirect uh, inappropriate behavior. Uh, are, are part of that too. Yeah, because from my experience, it's a lot of, it's a big reason why people leave because they don't know how to manage <laughs> the the classroom. Sure. Um, yeah, um, I don't know if I should make a remark about social justice, but um, um, you know, uh, maybe I should say that, but uh, let me just say that, you know, we do have re redistribution of wealth in this country and it's going to the top 1%. So, um, we, uh, I guess every, everybody has a different definition. I get the idea it should be clear what we mean by these terms that we're using. Um, but I think, uh, uh, you know, what kind of ideology it has. I, but, but if we just um, uh, acknowledge the truth of what's happening, then, um, you know, and, and realize that when we're teaching it, sometimes the kids on the lower economic spectrum are not there because of any deficiencies for them or their parents. They're just there because they happen to be born into, you know, a community or uh, a legacy of uh, poverty. And we should acknowledge that they're not, it's not that they're not intelligent. It's not that they're not capable, but to, to understand the socioeconomic, socioeconomic impact, what it has on, on on uh, people and uh, not make assumptions about them and, and help them to become all they can be. They reach every opportunity they can and to have a more just society in, in the process. So I think social justice is fine, but I do think some clarification on what it actually means is, is, uh, is probably a good idea. Thank you, Ms. Fecto. Uh, Mr. Bondano. Hi. Um, so when we talk about teacher uh, shortages and trying to solve the issue of teacher shortages, uh, I know that critical to that will be trying to get teachers from out of state to want to teach in Michigan. So do these standards bring us more or less in line with the preparation and certification standards for other states? Uh, that's uh, that's a great question. Um, and I, I would say it's a, a little of, of both. Um, <laughs> so depending on how up to date uh, individual states uh, standards are, these were crafted in uh, very close um, alignment with national standards. Uh, so National Council of Teachers of English, uh, National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, uh, and uh, American uh, Mathematics Teacher Educators. Um, with those those teacher preparation standards in uh, the forefront uh, of the work and states that have upgraded their standards to uh, be more in alignment or whose standards are always in well in alignment with uh, those standards, uh, it's going to be it's going to be fine. The the real test will be when the uh, Michigan test for teacher certification that is based on these standards debuts, then we will see if somebody prepared in another state uh, is able to demonstrate at least pencil and paper uh, understanding of uh, the material that's embodied in our standards. 
Thank you, Mr. Bondano. Other uh, other questions? Other questions, comments, concerns, fears, phobias, neuroses, Mr. McMillan. Uh, yeah, I, I forgot to mention, I forgot to ask. Um, so 22 to 24% disagreed. Is that, that seems high to me, but maybe it's not. Is that uh, a generally consistent to when we put out standards? Um, Thank you for that. It's actually lower. Um, we'd often we'll often have standard sets where it's more of a 60-40 split or a 55-45 split, um, uh, or even 70-30. So when they're you know close, when it's only about a quarter. And then the the question was about the um, you know if you had agreed whether these standards would improve the preparation right. of of these. And so there were a number of reasons why somebody selected no. Um, very, very, very few were because they thought the standards were not good standards. Uh, uh, the, the majority of those who said no said things like, well, it depends on whether the, the program has good clinical experiences. Standards won't fix anything. Um, it uh, uh, small, small grade bands uh, will make things bad for us. So they were not not in this space of having fundamental disagreements with the content of the standards. Okay. I mean, uh, I, other than social studies, I don't recall anything. If you could send me four uh, examples of four or five that had 55, 45, or 60, 40 in the next few days, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, other board members, comments or questions or concerns? Remember that standard setting is different from the hiring process. It's the uh, standard setting within your teacher prep programs. It's what happens uh, with our young people in the teacher prep programs. They come out, they're certified, uh, they are certified, and that is itself um, slightly different from the um, um, the area of the possible in which you can uh, teach. There's a little bit more flexibility than his has historically been the case, and that greater flexibility is in fact a function of a uh, teacher shortage. But that's not in a fully elastic flexibility. It doesn't permit you as a rule to use your five year certification to go teach in a completely different subject. It permits you to teach a little bit out of a grade range, but not in a completely different subject. The latter case would only be in an extraordinary circumstance when a district was unable to get a certified teacher in a given area. And then at that point, that school district is permitted to hire somebody as a long term sub or on a one year permit to um, address that teaching position outside of certification. But that is unrelated to the circumstance that we are discussing here. Other questions or comments? Fears or phobias? Hearing none, seeing none. Um, if we could have a roll call vote, please, Marilyn. Yes. Fechtel? Yes. McMillan? No. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Ramos Montini? Yes. Snyder? No. Tilly? Tilly? Yes. Tiffany is saying yes. Albrecht? Yes. Passes 6-2. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Um, next item on today's agenda is the state and federal legislative update. Um, we will uh, 
We have Marty Ackley, our Director of Public and Governmental Affairs, um, who will lead the state and federal legislative update. And most importantly, our chairperson, Ms. Lupe Ramos Montini, um, will, uh, will uh, kick us off, I believe. Ms. Ramos Montini. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, as the legislative chair uh, of this committee, uh, we're here to report to you that because of the pandemic, we haven't been able to meet uh, and formulate any, uh, uh, well, many different um, legislative items. However, because of school opening, now we have something very important in our hands that we would like to report on today. Now, uh, as I said, I'm the chair of the committee, the legislative committee. Dr. Judy Pritchard is a co-chair and the Honorable Nikki Snyder is a member of the committee. Our liaisons are Marty Eckley, Caroline Lisa, uh, Stephen DeGrove, and our beloved Marilyn Schneider. And our special guest at this last meeting was our superintendent, uh, Michael Rice. We met on Tuesday, July the 28th from 1 to 2. So uh, at this time, I would like to uh, refer the, the floor to Marty Eckley, and we're going to start by uh, informing you some items on returning to school. Marty? You're on mute, Marty. Marty, you need to unmute. There we go, I'm sorry. So I'll be brief as the sun is nearly setting here today. Uh, we did have a, a, a robust discussion uh, on July 28th, as Ms. Ramos Montini said. Uh, we discussed the governor's, um, at that time, her executive order 2021-42, uh, return to school and the return to school roadmap. We also discussed, um, as Dr. Rice really went into um, uh, deep explanation this morning about the issues of days and hours and attendance and enrollment, as well as state assessments. He discussed that as well as a package of bills, uh, House bills that are going through the legislature right now, House bills 4910 through 4913. And they have passed the House. They've come out of the Senate Education Committee and they're on the Senate floor. The governor's office is um, in negotiations with the legislature, as Dr. Rice mentioned today. And the Senate actually is coming in on a rare Saturday session uh, this Saturday at 10 a.m. to um, to hopefully um, expectedly um, take up this legislation and a negotiated package of bills to um, get to returning to school. And the House is coming in on a rare Monday session recently, uh, Monday morning to um, finish up what the Senate um, is expected to do on Saturday. We also discussed briefly the state budget shortfalls and how the legislature and Governor Whitmer um, reconciled the closing of fiscal year 2019-2020 budget. The discussions are still ongoing for the next fiscal year budget, which uh, begins October 1st, that's fiscal year 2021. Um, and then as Dr. Rice discussed this morning, the federal funding is still up in the air and he um, is urging Congress to again, um, come through for states, including Michigan, on needed funding. Um, so other than that, I mean, that was a pretty thorough discussion and Dr. Rice went over that um, in depth this morning. Um, and if there's anything else you want to add, Dr. Rice? No, thank you, sir. Okay. So unless there's any questions. Uh, Judy, just... uh, do you have anything to add to the report? No, not at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nikki? I do not, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, that could, uh, okay, question. Uh, there's Dr. Wright. Tom has a question. Yeah, I, I guess I'm, um, and I know we already talked about it once, but the 5913, I just, 
Marty, when it was going through uh, the House committee, I actually tried to get it amended. Uh, I mean, one of a state rep that I know, I was encouraging and trying to get them to uh, to really not allow the benchmarking test to go to the state at all. I mean, I don't, I don't, I still don't really understand why the state needs it, and um, I'm just concerned that it's going to be used for things that it that it's not designed for, and I just don't. Uh, you know, I just don't, I don't, I, I would rather it not be sent to the state. And so I just, I don't know, is there any movement in something like that, Marty? I mean, or is that a pretty, I don't know, I just, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like the board to take a stand that uh, we would oppose such a move. Yeah, I, I personally am not involved in those discussions, so I can't attest to um, whether assessments is a key part of those discussions that of that package. I know that days and hours and attendance and, and enrollment are. Assessments may be. I'm not sure if Brandy Johnson is on the call still, um, if she has any insight, but um, I'm not sure. I am on the call. Um, I wouldn't disagree with anything you said, Marty. I would say that the um, what we have been discussing, it, the scope is very narrow. Um, to address the issues that are most um, urgently needed to address to start the school year. Okay, so so Brandy, the governor isn't necessarily pushing for the benchmarking to come to the state. I mean, that would be that would be good on my in my view if she wasn't. Um, I think I'd like I'd like to respect the process with the legislature okay. and let it play out. Okay. Um, I'm but sorry. I think you'll you'll hear more about this probably even tomorrow. Okay. Um, well, and certainly by Saturday <laughs> at the latest. Right. But if I could, Brandy, is it is it fair to say, um, just to reiterate what you said, that you had four House bills that passed the House, House bills 59, 10, 11, 12, and 13, and they had a wide range of elements within them. And um, the governor and the governor's team have expressed an interest in really a, a very, very, very narrow swath of those elements um, related to what is necessary to get the school year begun and not um, a wide ranging set of initiatives um, that would really uh, be sea changes in the midst of a pandemic. Is that fair? That is fair. And also, I mean, um, part of the narrowness of that scope is really focusing on just this upcoming school year rather than uh, making more permanent changes that would, um, you know, that would have that that would be more permanent into future school years, presumably not in the context of a pandemic. Right. So 5910 through 5913 were um, represented a wide range of changes um, or a wide range of proposed changes. And um, there is an effort um, within negotiation to be much narrower in focus. OK. Yep, that's right. Thank you. I think Dr. Um, Albrich has a, meet, has a Michelle, question. I think Michelle. I think, I think it's I think it's Ms. Fecto and then President oh. Albrich. OK. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, so I have a couple of things I wanted to say. One was, um, again, I uh, do as far as holding enrollment um, as you know, um, not doing the count day this year using last year's numbers. Does that look like something that might move Marty or no? Is there a resistance to that or is there you would expect that to pass or what do you think? Again, um, Michelle, I'm not intimately involved in the, the negotiations on that. I'm not sure if Brandy has any insight that she is uh, at liberty to share. I'm just not at liberty to share right at this very second, but um, but I think there will be clarity on that um, issue uh, for Saturday's session. Yeah, well, I, I would strongly urge you to suspend those um, the count day because it's um, on behalf of all of the, the teachers and administrators that have told me that that, that would be great. So I just wanted to make that um, statement. The other is I wanted to support what Tom just said about the benchmark assessments. 
I, I just don't see the point um, given COVID and the, how it would be administered. Um, I don't uh, trust the some of the folks that will might want to use this as some sort of a um, a comparable benchmark assessment data. It's I don't think it's a comparable. I don't think it's going to be um, the data is going to be strong enough and the focus so much on assessments and all right. So this is as a parent and an advocate around special ed is, you know, I, I have found that these types of assessments are to the detriment of certain populations because what happens is it becomes an, uh, a focus on just getting test scores or having good test scores and prepping for test scores and or you know it, it, and then it's used to say a school has failed somehow when this data is not really valid i and even if it's not being used as we did with race to the top and no child left behind i still think there's a danger to using it especially when the data is not um is just so questionable and um, the, I think the teachers, administrators have enough to do um, and they can use those assessments internally, but I just don't see the point of using them and, and holding them up as being anything close to fair or valid uh, under the conditions. And, and the, you know, the flip side is if there's this focus on, on testing, um, it often leaves certain people who don't test very well <laughs> you know, in a bad spot. And so I, I would encourage um, uh, not using them, not collecting them, letting the schools use them um, to provide instruction and to see where they need to improve. But I just don't think they're collectively, they're meaningful in any way and can be and potentially harmful. Okay, thank you, Dr. Albrich and then Dr. Pritchett. So, I just have to say that, you know, this is, and this isn't just now, it, it, this is a long time coming, but this pandemic I think has really shown a light on the fact that this board is not respected. And Brandy, I appreciate the fact that you say that there's gonna be clarity come Saturday, but come Saturday, the whole thing's done. So as the president of this board, I, I'm offended that we are not included in conversations to a greater extent. And on behalf of this board, I hope that you can take this back to the process that you guys engage in because I'm offended. And, and I don't like being told that I will find out after the fact, after the whole negotiations are done, that we will then get to find out what's actually in the bill and what's going to be decided on. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Albrich, Dr. Pritchett. Thank you. Um, I uh, certainly concur with Dr. Ulbricht's uh, remarks. Um, it is extremely frustrating as a board member uh, to uh, not be part of the process, at least to be able to give our feedback uh, because we are state elected officials also. I also want to uh, voice my um, concurrence with Mr. McMillan and uh, with Ms. Fecto right now. Um, as, as we get closer to school opening, whatever date that's going to be for local districts, uh, what I am observing across the state is um, they are so focused on how are we going to open, how are we going to keep our students safe, how are we going to meet the needs of our families. And I do believe that many of them will do some benchmark testing if they're able to, if their students are able to come to school, enter building, uh, and teachers are able to be able to administer those benchmark assessments. And while it would be good to have that data because I think the benchmark assessments are uh, important data for us to be able to look at, I think this is not the year to do it. Um, there is just too many other pressures on our local districts and so hopefully that can be one of the compromises. I know the, the House voted the whole package over. I understand how legislation works um, and um, the um, negotiations that are probably going on behind the scenes, but um, if anybody is listening to us at all, uh, that would be my feedback at this point. The enrollment 
um, the days, the hours, those are the important issues. Those are the questions that districts need answered and they need answered pretty quickly at this point. Um, and um, they will do what is right by the kids. They know how to instruct. They know how to open school and take care of their students in whatever mode they have decided they need to do that. Uh, they don't need an added, oh, we've got to get this done because we have to report it somewhere at this point. Uh, at some point, I do believe that that data will be important. But again, the more I've been able to reflect, especially the last week or so, and watching schools try to open and make those decisions. And I've seen some districts make one decision one day and they have to change that decision three or four days later because of community data that they're getting. Um, I just don't want that added to them at this point. We need to answer the important questions for them right now. Um, and those are the ones that have already been talked about. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pritchett. Dr. Pugh, and uh, then it appears Ms. Fecto again. Um, actually, the board members haven't left much more uh, for me to say. I guess I would just ask that if, you know, if, if if there's a motion that we need to make or if there's anything that or statement that we could make uh, that that would support um, what, what we are saying here. I mean, I think as what was just said by Dr. Pritchett, the schools know um, that they're going to be me measuring deficit. They're going to be measuring uh, trauma um, and the other uh, unfortunate things that children are experiencing right now. So I, I would uh, have to agree with the approach that, that uh, my fellow board members are taking thus far. Okay, thank you, Ms. Fecto and then Mr. McMillan. Um, yeah, just a quick comment. I just wanted to support Cassandra. Um, I think it's important as an elected member, she's served for many years now. I think she's going on what? number 10 or 12 years as on the board and has been dedicated um, uh, and worked really hard, has really immersed herself in all these issues um, to include her in these conversations. I know the governor wants to be inclusive of all voices. She has a quadrant, but I think it's, um, it's missing a great resource and it would connect the board in these decisions. And I, I just think it would, it's, it's just, um, a missed opportunity not to include the board president um, in, in these conversations. So I encourage you to, um, if, as soon as possible, include um, uh, Cassandra as a, as a valuable resource in education policy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fecto. Mr. McMillan? Mr. McMillan, I believe for the first time today, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I don't want to get ahead of anybody else, but at the proper time, I'd like to make a motion just, uh, you know, solidifying or uh, memorializing this uh, idea that we as a board oppose the benchmark assessment data that's contemplated in House Bill 5913 being submitted to the state. Um, OK, so that's a motion. Do I have a second? I have a support from Dr. Pugh in the chat. Any discussion? Uh, if we could have a roll call vote, Marilyn. Yes, Fecto, could you please repeat what we're voting on? So I'm, it's, I'm sorry, I'm not clear. The, the Michigan State Board of Education opposes benchmark assessment data related to House Bill 5913 being submitted to the state legislature, right, Tom? Well, to the M Michigan Department of Education or any any department of the state. I'm, okay. I, I'm open to wordsmithing. I just, I, whatever it is, I don't want the locals to be required to send this data to the state um, and then for the state to use it in what, you know, whatever way that they'd want to. I just don't want it. I don't think it's necessary. I vote yes. Okay. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. 
Ramos Spontini? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Tilly? Yes. yes. Albridge? Yes. Unanimous yes. approval, 8-0 passes. Okay, Very thank good. you. And I know that it could end up being put in some Senate bill, I, I, but I think the, you know, Marty, you and Dr. Rice understand the intent of what the motion. If whatever, whatever, wherever it goes in the next week, you know, I think we we oppose it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, that is the report of state and federal um, legislative committee. Um, Ms. Tilly, do you have a report on uh, NASB? Uh, I'm getting in the chat. No, I do not. Very good. Thank you very much for um, for sharing that. Um, any board member comments? We're nearing the end of the meeting. Comments by state board members. Dr. Pugh, a question? Yeah, I guess the question kind of overlaps here and it just it goes back to it, it can go in comments. I'm not sure if it would go in in the legislative discussion, but um, I wasn't quite sure here how we were, you know, if the topic of, you know, returning to school was going to come up and get into, you know, these decisions that are being made. But I just want to, you know, make sure that that um, it be known that I think it was on July 22nd um, that I did a press event and talked about the uh, some of the environmental, the, the risk of exposure um, and various exposure risks. And so I just don't want that to pass us by because there were some very important materials that were provided. Um, we had uh, Clara Barnett from a uh, national school, uh, uh, safe school network. And um, then we also just had a presentation by um, Sonia Ponce from ASHRAE. And so I just want to make sure that we are able to, um, as a board, talk about how these other factors are considered as schools are, are thinking about opening. Um, you know, myself, I don't think that schools are considering this in their, their return plans uh, because it's, it just was not something that, that they were thinking about. Um, I do think that the guidance that they're given, as I mentioned earlier, has been hodgepodge and it's, and it's going to impact our teachers, our, our, uh, our families and, and our children. And so I just want to know how do we influence the decisions that are being made, being that we're the State Board of Education. And, and I too, I, I support um, what was said by Cassandra as, um, as our president, that she be a part of, of the various discussions. But you know, making sure that that we're able to give input there. I mean, I think that that's a huge, uh, we're hearing a lot. We know that the, that the schools are not prepared in this area. And so I guess the, that's a question um, that I have. I, maybe I should have added it to, uh, you know, to that legislative discussion I was trying to get in before that closed out, because um, it's not just a comment, it, it is a question. Um, and then hoping that we are able to uh, at least, at the very least, be providing school districts with uh, access to people who can guide them on um, how to address their buildings and making sure that they're reducing the uh, exposure risk. Uh, the other question that I'll just have is, is in the plan that was provided, the Safe Schools Roadmap, from what I understand that there wasn't really facilities people that were a part of that discussion. So I guess those those are questions that I have. Thank you very much. Um, other board members, um, Ms. Fecto. Yeah, um, I just wanted to um, uh, thank all of the teachers, administrators, school board members, community parents who are struggling and working so hard to ensure that kids are getting what they need. Um, these are just such incredibly difficult times and I know um, people are working really hard to make the right decisions um, 
and uh, and I just wanted to voice my appreciation and support for all those efforts. Um, and I wish everyone well at the start of the school year. Thank you, Ms. Fecto. Um, other um, other questions or comments? Dr. Pugh, did you get your ore fully in the water? You're on, you're on mute. I did. I was just trying to make sure that that that, that those were that it was known that those were two questions. The one about the facilities is is there facilities guidance that was provided on the Safe Schools Roadmap that task force that produced that report. And then number two, is there, um, you know, how do we uh, make sure that uh, these other environmental exposures are, are addressed? Um, and then how do we uh, make sure that, that districts are getting, are having access to appropriate information? Um, and I, I was referring to some of the reports that have been put out by the Safe Schools Network, as well as uh, our the person who provided comment um, through the engineer, the the, um, the heating, uh, air conditioning, uh, and refrigeration engineers association. So, Brandy, do you do you want to take any part of that? Sure. So, uh, the roadmap does have second sections related to operations and facilities. We also have an operations and facilities subcommittee of the advisory council, which includes representatives from uh, things like transportation uh, experts. They have uh, created some new recommendations. Today, I actually suggested that uh, that subcommittee work directly with MDE on developing some additional guidance, particularly as it relates to transportation. And in addition, uh, we had a call last week with Eagle uh, about developing some guidance as it relates to air quality in schools. Uh, Dr. Brandy Brown is working on that. I expect that I'll have her draft uh, guidance within the next couple of days, and then we can um, distribute it and and certainly send it to uh, Superintendent Rice to distribute as well. Uh, Eagle has also developed some guidance related to wa water and the importance of flushing water, um, given that uh, schools have buildings have been closed for so long. And so that has been distributed via Eagle as well. Um, I hope that the Department of Education is open to the Advisory Council providing input into the types of guidance that they're also hearing that is needed. Um, and I know that they would be willing to help the department uh, co-develop that additional guidance if appropriate. So can I, can I just ask a couple more questions, Dr. Rice? Uh, Please. Um, Okay, so at first, I just want to make sure that you that you did receive the report and the information that that I sent um, on the report because it does include all of that. And then my my I want to just be on the record and say that you know this this type of information came post the um, recommendations that were put in the uh, roadmap, and so. I am against schools opening without having that guidance and being able to provide those necessary supports uh, in the schools and making those, especially as it relates to ventilation. Um, so I just want to make that known. I don't know how, you know, how as a board we, we would move forward uh, and address that as a, as a board, but as a board member, I have been speaking about that um, and I wanted to make sure I was giving that information to the department as well as to the governor's office and uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. And, and good to hear that Eagle is a part of the discussions uh, now too. We are in uh, fairly constant contact with MDHHS. Uh, we met yesterday. Um, we've had other meetings. We've co-authored publications. But the Department of Health and Human Services is first and foremost responsible for, for health. Uh, MDE is not going to, um, will not have the requisite expertise to serve in that capacity. It is the Department of Health and Human Services 
that um, is responsible for public health in the state. And uh, we appreciate the partnership with the department and we'll continue to work with it, but we'll be guided by the department and not the other way around. Um, just wanted to um, to be clear on that. Mr. McMillan and then Ms. Snyder. Yeah, just going back to what I talked about with regard to education pods, and I do appreciate Dr. Rice, you being willing to talk to the administration in the areas because I really I don't see a lot of focus and and maybe I'm missing it but you know on parents and the conundrum that they are being put under uh, and I don't think it's suburban I think it only I think it's urban suburban rural I think it's everywhere uh, tens of thousands of families are just uh, in flux over what to do and so I I think you know whatever barriers need to be knocked down to provide as much creativity and flexibility um and i understand doing it anyway whether the law allows it or not is one way of doing it um but i i just know that there are you know when you have a house where 10 kids are coming in and out of neighbors might talk and they might say what's going on and it'd be nice for the person to say well i mean i i know that this is legal it's okay you know and so i just uh you know, I just think that it would be it would be something we just there needs to be a focus on on helping parents and especially in the next few weeks uh, as we're trying to as they're trying to scramble. Thanks. That's all. Thank you very much, Ms. Snyder. And then uh, Ms. Snyder for a comment, Dr. Pugh for a question. I just wanted to echo Michelle, um, Michelle's comments about um, just saying thank you to parents for staying engaged and teachers and everybody who's doing the best that they can do given the situation. And I think that's important for us to be sending that message. Please stay engaged the very best you can, whatever way it works best for you. Um, but just to go back to that access and opportunity discussion at the beginning of the meeting, um, I really sense that that needs to be one of the issues that, that is on our agenda for the next meeting. Um, really fully defining the current um, digital divide and connectivity divide. By the late fall, we should have a very solid handle on whether or not that is an issue to accessing remote learning. And as we continue to talk about each subject that we move forward with, that we are applying it to the here and now the very best we can. Um, I think it would be great to get something up and running like we did with the child care for the frontline workers, which is, I think it's kind of like a, uh, an immediate issue that we could, we could address within the department. Um, and I think that's particularly, it, there was a moment when we talked about um, the setting that we're all in together being particularly demotivating to some degree for many, many kids. I think sometimes when we talk about assessments, um, it makes us, you know, the, the sense of this is an invalid assessment of my current capacity or it is an assessment of your current capacity. How does that translate to your future? I continue to say frequently that if we acknowledge the gap in a way that is the most positive, we can consider it an opportunity to grow. So even as it continues to grow itself, um, whatever way we can be highly engaged um, to minimize it for now. Is, is the biggest thing that I'll probably continue to say. Thank you, Ms. Snyder. Dr. Pugh? My question is, I just want to make sure that that's clear because we do have schools opening now. We have guidance that has come post these schools starting to open. Some of the schools in the worst shape. Are these schools going to have this information as it relates to their uh, risk of exposure prior to them opening can we make sure that we as a department uh get districts the information to folks like uh, Ms. Ponce or others who might be able to provide them guidance maybe even you know I, I have talked to local folks health departments may be able to provide guidance of course uh when we talk about um pathogens and uh viruses and exposure in that way it's a little bit an, an infectious disease that it gets more complicated so I'm just making sure that I'm saying that yes, Department of Health and Human Services is good that we have a great relationship with them, but the Department of Education wants to make sure that that, that children are 
able to be in school buildings where they can learn um, and not become at, at, with a threat of, of, of being physically ill, as well as their educators. Um, you know, one of the CDC's top, uh, one of their main uh, focus points was making sure that children and teachers uh, could be protected. And I'm just trying to make sure that that is the case if a lot of the information that we're talking about that ensures that came post some of the guidance. And I know schools are focused on so many different things that, that it's not about the environment, um, some of the environmental factors that we're talking about here. So I just wanna make sure that I, I, I'm clear on that and that, that I'm getting that out and that we're giving them the, the tools that they need. What, uh, what would you have distributed? Um, there's, there are some toolkits and there are, and, and, and um, now that, I, I'm, that, that Brandy has just mentioned what she mentioned, I just wanna make sure that, that, that they have that toolkit that, that I, I think I provide, that was provided. Maybe there's a link to it in, in the materials that I sent over and then making sure that they have the contact information uh, for uh, for ASHRAE just in case they, they need those, uh, which, which is the American Society of Engineers um, in, in HVAC. So uh, I, those are two things that I, that I would provide. And of course, I, I, they probably hopefully are having conversations with their health department. Okay, thank you. We um, we have a meeting set up with uh, Dr. Ponce, and um, we also um, have the uh, the information. Um, I'll be talking to uh, our deputy superintendent for finance and operations, Mr. Garant, um, in about uh, eight minutes, just as soon as this meeting's over. Okay. Um, anything else uh, for the good of the order? Um, seeing and hearing none. Future meetings are Tuesday, September 8th, Tuesday, October 13th, Tuesday, November 10th, and Tuesday, November 8th, all at 9.30, and at least for the moment, um, all to be held uh, virtually. If there are topics that board members would like included in future meeting agendas, please notify uh, Marilyn or me. The time is now 3.48. Have a great day. Thank you.